Welcome back to The Charismatic Voice. By now, most of you know that my background is in classical music and opera, and I still love singing and listening to opera, even though I've been introduced to some pretty awesome worlds of rock and metal music through this channel. So today, I want to go back to my roots and share with you what I think is the most beautiful operatic duet of all time, the flower duet. Let's get to it. So right after this moment is where if you've heard this song before, you would probably recognize it. That'll get into the song proper, if you will. Up until this point, we've had a recitative, and it's a little more through composed um, than early recitatives you may have heard. Recitatives, um, it's where a lot of dialogue and action tends to happen in an opera. You can hear there's a lot of shifting in the music underneath. There tends to be a lot of lyrics that go by very quickly, and it's about setting up a scene, usually. So these two ladies are by the river, and they're saying, oh, look, the, the, uh, these flowers are blooming, and the other one says, oh, it's so happy, or nice to see you happy. And they essentially decide they're going to go down to the river and gather flowers. So that's all set up within the recitative. And as we got towards the end of this recitative, there's even hints of how the song is going to develop and they're going to essentially languish in the beauty of the, the moment, just really draw out the emotions further in the song proper. Um, the two women that we have here today, Sabine de, de, Vieille, de Vieille, French soprano, coloratura, high soprano, okay, very, very, very high. And then you have beside her a mezzo-soprano. Sometimes this is sung by uh, two sopranos, one that's got a heavier timbre and one that's got a much lighter timbre. But uh, today it's being sung by a coloratura soprano and a mezzo-soprano. Marion Crabassa is her name, also French. And then the whole orchestra here, um, they're called Les Siecles. So this is put together uh, by an entire French team, which is pretty awesome. Uh, a lot of times we don't necessarily have everybody who speaks the language normally working on operas in that particular language, but today we do. I'm gonna go back and talk about some beautiful moments here. <sighs> So I love the way that Sabine will lighten off of phrases very nicely. It can be hard to be delicate with some phrases at the end, especially when you're really high. And she's very good at sort of lifting off of them beautifully. In addition, it's so beautiful to hear the rustling of the orchestra underneath the part that I just stopped. It's like the leaves beside the river that are rustling. Check that out. Wrestle, 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 wrestle. And there's that lift. And notice how beautiful the enunciation is. She's getting all of her lyrics across, even though it's quite high and more difficult to get lyrics across up there. And this is particularly important because this is the recitative, right? This is where you're setting up the scene. Oh, <laughs> 
So right there, when you started to hear a little bit of flowing in the orchestra, that's when they're hinting at the song that they're about to go into. And notice particularly the difference in timbre between these two women. If you're a color tour soprano, you tend to have a much lighter, much higher timbre. And there's different types of color tour sopranos even. You have a lyric color tour, you have a light lyric color tour, you have a full lyric color tour, or you might have a dramatic color tour soprano. I tended to do more of the dramatic color tour soprano roles myself, and then my voice grew and I went into doing other kinds of roles like speed to soprano things later on. Now, if you listen to Marianne's voice, it's much deeper in the timbre. It's much, has more velvet, more warmth to it. So this is a really good example of what two different kinds of timbres sound like in voice types. A lot of people come to me and they say, oh, I've got this kind of range. What voice type am I? And I say, okay, ranges are not the only thing that define voice type. It is one indicator, but it is not the most important one. Tone quality and timbre, that is actually a better indicator of what kind of voice type a person has. And this deeper velvety sound that Marianne has is an indicator that she's a mezzo-soprano, whereas the brighter, lighter sound that Sabine has is the indicator that she's a color tour soprano. Let's go back just a little bit, listen. Oh, go back. Oh, just a little bit more so you can hear Sabine first. Okay. Much lighter. Beautiful decrescendo on the top there. goodness I just noticed something I've never noticed before I think Gandalf just walked by in the background <laughs> that's amazing okay sorry to interrupt this gorgeousness I've watched this video oh my goodness at least at least 20 times if not 50 it's many 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 times I love this song so much um, thank you for allowing me to see Gandalf for the first time talk about all of these glorious moments. This for me is one of those pieces that you can just like sit back and and seep in. It's so glorious to listen to. It feels like it surrounds you in beautiful colors and it's easy to listen to. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. So ah, I wanted to let it play a little bit before I did um, some some deeper analysis in here. One of the main things that is really wonderful about this duet is how the voices run together. There are times when they're running just like in, in very close intervals, beautiful harmonies, and the runs together are like the running water in the river, essentially. 
super, super beautiful. But there are also moments when the lower part has more words than the higher part. This is really smart, smart writing from Delib. And it essentially allows the soprano on top to not to have to worry about so many words. On top, our ears just stop being able to distinguish many words when it's that high. When it gets above the, the treble clef, it's like, mm, good luck, right? And that's why a lot of times people say, oh, I, I couldn't understand the soprano. I couldn't understand her. And say, so, well, the, the frequency was so high that your ears actually, and the way that frequencies and vowels work, we stop really defining a lot of vowels up there anymore. So um, the soprano has less words in the in the text that she's reading, whereas the mezzo has a lot more. So like, for example, um, in the very beginning, you have uh, le jasma, is what the soprano will say. But the mezzo says, sous le dôme épais ou le blanc jasma. And that's a lot more words to fit in. But she's fitting them in these sort of like rolling, rippling uh, melody lines underneath, which is super beautiful. Uh, let's go back. Go back just a little bit. Here we go. Here's that moment. You hear the extra words underneath. You've heard me talk a few times about how they're lightly lifting off the ends of phrases. That's one of the things that can be difficult about having certain elegance in operatic repertoire. The need to be able to sing a high note and lightly get off of it instead of just having a nice wham bam ending, right? I, coming for the more dramatic side where my voice is more tending towards dramatic repertoire, it is much easier for me to go wah and have a nice, very uh, powerful cutoff. And these two ladies are both going like whoop on the end of this. It's so beautiful and perfect. I've worked on this. I worked on the high color tour role, um, both in this duet and in the bell aria, which she sings a, a fantastic aria in this opera that is uh, particularly stunning but never did get the chance to perform them because my voice had started really growing heavier at that point. So it wasn't suited for color tour work anymore, especially this particular role, which is much lighter. Um, by the way, this entire opera is very, very rarely performed. Uh, it's you know definitely not in the top 50 that are performed every year. So just to give you some perspective, this duet is performed all the time. It's placed in all kinds of videos. People love this duet. And the aria is pretty famous as well. But uh, the whole opera, mm, not performed very often. Listen to the phrasing up the, at the ends here. <laughs> it's gorgeous. I love the swells in here too. Watch Sabine's mouth in here because she gives a really good indication of how, um, of good mouth shapes essentially on the top. <laughs> There's a saying uh, for going really high, we'll just say drop for the top. And sometimes they'll say it to me in two ways. One is when you go really high, your jaw needs to go down. So just drop your jaw for the top note. You can see that her tongue is also fairly high in her mouth position, which is good. And additionally, sometimes we'll say drop for the top, meaning that you need to drop into your lower support to reach a higher note. Okay, so when she goes up, there are times when she's holding the same vowel 
but she moves up a higher note and you see her mouth actually get longer. This is a little vowel modification that's happening. Even though it sounds like she's seeing mostly the same vowel there, that modification in her mouth helps her to sing those high notes with more clarity, better timbre overall. One more time. So the frémissante is the top word that they're singing and sante is the last part. By the way, in French, you have these nasal vowels. So this is an A-N. And when you sing in French, you tend to let a lot less nasality in the sound than you would when you're speaking. So it almost sounds like they're just singing an ah vowel up there instead of a nasal ah. Did you see that extra stretch up for the top note? Same vowel, just a little more stretch. Same thing right there, a little more stretch. That is very carefully coordinated there. You can see that they're really paying attention to each other's body language. You don't see shoulders happening. The body language tends to be more of a like um, leaning and sort of almost dancing, like very light dancing as they're singing this. And obviously, you know, this is a recording session they've got set up. This isn't, um, this isn't a concert in a hall, but it, we're actually hearing what they recorded during this session. And Notice how far away their microphones are from their mouths. This is one of the key differences between recording opera and recording other genres. In, in pop, people get six inches away from the microphone, sometimes closer, hopefully not too much closer because you sometimes get plosives like peas or something that really spark the microphone in a, a bad way but people can get really close into the microphone. Basses in particular in acapella groups, they tend to eat their microphone. I mean, it's, it's like really way up there. But in opera, we're used to hearing it without microphones. So when you record opera, the singers tend to stand further away from the microphone. It's a very, a very distinct difference. If you heard these women up against the microphones closer, you would say they had way too many consonants. Those consonants are gonna be much harsher in the microphone, but that's the kind of consonant that you need to sing with in a theater that has 4,000 seats so that you can actually still be understood. Go back a little bit more, beautiful time on the end here. <laughs> I love the conductor's hands. I love this part in Sabine's voice because she is um, a much lighter colored tourist soprano. And it's not just all beautiful, light lyric lines. She had a little more drama, lots of emotion that came to this. And she's saying, you know, I'm worried about these things. Uh, this was set in the British Isles and uh, had to do with occupation of um, some British soldiers and army. And her father is a Brahmin priest. And you know that things might possibly turn out badly because of the whole setup. In fact, uh, there's a love thing that happens in Lakme, which is the role that Sabine's playing right here, uh, ends up dying at the end. It's opera, you know, not, not that unusual. Uh, but anyhow, so you hear the worry really enter her voice. And I like that Sabine is able to bring that quality to the character instead of just being light and fluffy. It really has more juice and power. I 
Uh, the thing that Marianne is doing, by the way, that she's cupping her ear, but leaving some space there. It, it's so she can hear herself a little bit better. Sometimes when you're in the middle of the orchestra like that, it might be, it's a lot of sound. <laughs> so it can be helpful to cup your ear and hear a little bit of the sound that's coming out as well. That's really good. Another thing that's interesting is to watch both of their bodies. Their bodies are interested in staying, or I should say their torsos are very interested in staying expanded. If they let their air out too quickly, they know um, that well, they'll lose a lot of breath control. They have long phrases to sing in here. Um, but ultimately you don't want that breath to suddenly shoot out very quickly into a note because it'll make it unstable. It'll not feel good on the vocal folds, all of the good things. So a lot of times you'll see Sabine is kind of lifting her arms out to the side and Marianne, uh, she'll do other things, similar things as well. Even having this up here helps to keep the rib cage more expanded. Having your arms crossed um, can actually help keep your backspace more expanded. So a lot of their posture um, is centered around a uh, good breathing technique essentially. <laughs> Even that hand up there helps keep the ribs expanded. Oh, that's, that line is so hard. That line is so hard. The tuning is difficult and having enough air to get to the end is difficult. And it's really hard to time with orchestra perfectly. She did a beautiful job there. Right, no breath before that line too. Perfect. Oof. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> the leaf is essentially, he's written these beautiful harmonies that are, are close to each other and just wiggling in and out like this. And it, there are extra wiggles in it. So it, he's not the parts where they're close together and harmonizing and going up and down like this. Uh, those aren't parts where they're trying to relate words, right? That's that idea of, I think, river flowing by or maybe flower petals flowing by. And he has them go around and then do moments where they go up and down and you can really hear this ebb and flow throughout it. This one was a little different. It went higher than the last time as if, oh, well, you know, the river doesn't always flow exactly the same way. Sometimes there are exciting moments or drafts in it. <laughs> Oh, look at that extended uh, rib cage there. Yeah, that part I also want to talk about. They have a marking that is loud and then soft. It takes a ton of vocal control. Louder here. And softer right here. And then quiet again. Same contrast and dynamics right there. Oh, so pretty. <laughs> oh, good timing. So pretty. I have to talk about one other thing here at the end, and that is the French schwa. At the end of a lot of French words, you have e, uh, which is just an e that's written. And a lot of times when singing, um, singers get coached in how to sing these schwas, essentially. It is not the same as speaking, once again. A lot of people think, oh, if I can speak a language, I can sing it. That is no, that's not how it works. One of the first things you do when you go to a conservatory is 
you take a semester in English diction, right? English diction, because you have to learn how to sing in English. It seems like it should be obvious, but it's not. There's lots of different things we can do while singing to make our words more clear. And then beyond that, you have a semester of studying each language, English, German, French is the common, uh, common three. And then you have another semester beyond that and the diction of each of those languages. And often it's required that you actually take a year of those languages, just not in the diction, but just the study of how they're put together. So uh, the schwa at the end of this is very important uh, that people still hear that it's an u uh sound at the end, but you'll notice that Sabine in particular, her mouth is more open than you would have it if you were speaking. If you went uh on that top note, it wouldn't sound very good. It needs to be a little more open there. So the same thing, even Marianne opens her mouth a little bit more. Beautiful. Thank you so much for taking a moment to enjoy some opera with me. I know usually we're doing things like rock and metal and acapella and all kinds of other genres on this channel, but sometimes it's good to go back and take a look at where a lot of our music has evolved from and how it's still being performed today. There is so much detail and passion and so many glorious moments in operatic repertoire. So I really enjoy getting to take a moment and dive into it with you all. If you like this kind of analysis, we have a playlist over here of some more operatic analysis that I have done. So I hope to see you over there in another video soon. Thanks.